Our next speaker we're really excited about, uh, Dr. Kate Gaudet, is the scholar of history, or is a scholar of history of reading. Uh, she's the associate director of the university honors program at the University of New Hampshire, where she's also a member of the humanities faculty. Uh, she's published on topics which include suicide, bankruptcy, education, and early America. And she teaches courses on the narrative structures of topics like addiction, epidemics, and criminality. In 2015, she received a grant from the National Endowment of Humanities to develop a course called What is a Criminal? And she's currently editing an essay collection of the same title, which is going to be coming out in 2022. Um, so without further ado, uh, Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I, I can't turn my camera on, so I think I need you to do that for me. I'll work on that. Okay, and in fact, I'm going to be mainly doing um, a PowerPoint so you don't actually necessarily need to see me. Thank you so much for having me here today. And it's been so fantastic to hear uh, the previous speakers. And I think you'll hear that I'll be sort of repeating some of the points that they have made, um, which to me says, you know, we're all on the same page here, which is really terrific. Um, so I uh, am from the University of New Hampshire, um, which is, you know, not part of Appalachia, but as you'll, as I'll talk about a little bit, we have we have some things in common. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start my slideshow. Oh, here's my video. Hello. Um, I think you might be able to see me now, but then I'm going to take myself away and start my PowerPoint. So if you are, you know, folding laundry or whatever else you might be doing in this um, Zoom meeting, uh, now might be a time to take a look at the screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, I'm going back and forth between PowerPoint and Zoom. Uh, am I able to share my screen? Yes, you should be able to, you okay. have access. Perfect, here we are. And then we just have to move the Zoom panel so that we can get to the PowerPoint stuff. Someday this will all be very smooth. I'm waiting for that day. Okay, here we go. So um, hopefully you can all see my PowerPoint now. Um, so yeah, so my, my presentation is called Hooked Narratives of Addiction, Recovery, and Redemption. And as I'll talk about, I think that these terms get kind of mixed together in a way um, that changes the way we think about these topics and that by digging into them, we can um, have more creative and open and possibly realistic ways to understand addiction. So I'm gonna start with um, one image of addiction. Now this comes from 1751, so a very long time ago, but it's another time of a panic about drugs. Um, and the drug of the time was gin. So uh, there's a history where there's a lot more gin production because grain prices had fallen. So there was an encouragement of distillery. So anyway, there's all this gin all over the place and much of it is quite poisonous. It gets mixed with turpentine. So it is a little bit like um, opioids today getting mixed with who knows what and, um, and actually killing people. Um, and as you can see in the image, you know, uh, this is sort of the ent entertainment of 1751. This was a cheap engraving that people could buy and you know, spend a lot of time looking at. It's a very, very dense image and I'm not going to go into all of the different um, things that are depicted here, but you can see that Gin Lane is a very terrible place. Um, the central you know, striking image is this woman dropping her baby <laughs> who, who is falling presumably to its death with a really horrified expression on its face. So this, you know, this is familiar, right? This is the this is the effect of, of a terrible drug. And it was printed, you can barely see it in this image, but there's a little poem at the bottom and I've put the first um, verse of it there. On the other hand, this was printed along with another um, engraving, which was called Beer Street. Now Beer Street, you would think would also be a, a bad place to be, however, in this um, engraving, it's actually not. Beer Street is a much nicer place than Gin Lane. You can see that there is, um, you know, art and culture happening. There's uh, people building a building in the background, the scaffolding. So it's, you know, the, the development of the economy and the country. There's, uh, I suppose that's meant to be a romantic image in the front of a man and a woman and uh, various other things that I, are, are meant to be positive. And the, the first verse of the, poem that goes along with this um, 
sings the praises of beer. And it actually goes on to make fun of the French for drinking water and saying that beer is, is what English people will drink. It's a nationalistic kind of thing because it's made with local grain. Um, so I'm putting these two images up to begin with just to say, you know, the way you look at these, at these drugs um, are, is not all the same. And so just to start to tear apart the way we think about drugs and addiction and say there's really different views you can take on this and sometimes they're quite surprising. Uh, we're not currently in a panic about beer and gin, although there might be an argument that we should be. Um, so as I said, I, I teach in New Hampshire, um, which is not part of Appalachia and you might expect that it wouldn't be as affected as badly, but unfortunately we're regularly in the top five for overdose deaths. Um, and this is an article about why that might be. You can see that we, well, we have very little state funding um, and we're very rural and there's high prescription rates, a high older population, which is, you know, um, can correlate with higher prescription rates for pain medication. I also am amused by this um, website because you can see we're on, it's under the best states uh, rubric. So, you know, you don't always wanna be in that, in that top five but we are. So as opposed to the, um, the way that Hogarth was depicting addiction um, in his time, not a word that they would have used at the time actually, um, this is, these are the pictures we see of addiction today. And I'm sure this will look quite familiar to all of you um, that will, you know, we see these kind of gray black images, lots of red. Um, we see these, these charts of, you know, the terrible overdose deaths going up, you know, going up beyond where we could have ever imagined. Um, but we also are seeing some changes in perspective, um, the idea of treating addiction like a disease, which um, as a, as we've heard earlier today, that that's not necessarily from, a, I think Jason Harris was saying that, that you know, there's some problems with looking at it that way too, right? Um, and, uh, and then we have also here on the right, this image of here's, a, again, I find this an amusing image because it's so dark, right? It's so moody and it's, you know, quite familiar in this guy in a hoodie feeling bad about his choices. And this is super cheerful, like consumerist kind of um, image at the bottom of like, you know, buy now, click here to chat. I'm super happy and here to help you. The juxtaposition of that I think is kind of funny, but you know, also like you want a call to action in an, in an image like this to, uh, to get people into recovery. Um, so I'm going to move on to talk about how I think that we typically tell addiction stories. Um, so, you know, I'm just, this is going to be very broad strokes and, and with, with the recognition that they go in all different ways. But for most people, especially people who aren't super familiar with the topic, this is how they understand it working. You start with a kid, right? And he grows up and has normal experiences. He goes to school, he parties a little bit, maybe. Um, and maybe he meets someone, maybe he gets a job, but there might be a point, say in his 20s or early 20s or late teens, where he doesn't know what's up, he doesn't know what to do, he's feeling a little lost, and what happens? Drugs happen. So there's this inflection point in the story where he, you know, he takes his first drink or whatever it is um, he uses for the first time, and then we're going to see things go downhill. We're going to see, you know, drinking alone or using alone. Um, we might see um, medical issues, the ambulance, the policeman, the handcuffs, the hospital or the jail. Um, there's an idea of cycling, right? Like you, you might get a little bit better, might get worse again over and over until we end with some bad end of death. Um, and I, there's, I'm forgetting the phrase now, but uh, I think AA has a phrase of something about you end in institutionalized or in jail or dead or something like that. So this is, again, um, what we expect if you hit that inflection point in the wrong way. There's this other story too though, right? This is the story of recovery. What if at that rock bottom moment, he meets somebody who helps him join an organization, who helps him um, find a community, uh, introduces the rituals of meetings and of, um, you know, phrases that he can say to himself to help him along and of things to do that are not drinking and of people to support him. You know, there's this, <laughs> we switch to coffee, right? Um, we start collecting chips, things get better. Um, community, family, 
uh, and as they say in AA, you know, it's like off the charts happiness at the end, um, happiness like you would never have imagined. So what I'm saying here is, you know, we have these two kind of familiar stories that we know about. And, you know, that can be helpful, right? Like it, um, if we see somebody at some point along one of these paths, we kind of know what that means because we already have these stories in our heads. But it also can be hurtful because again, as everybody in this, uh, I would say room, but virtual room knows, there's a lot of stories that don't fit this model. Um, so actually this is, uh, again, this more conventional idea. Some of you may have heard of this Jelinek curve and this um, is still shared all over recovery um, media, but there's there's some problems with it, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up my notes here. Um, so this was uh, developed in the, sorry, again, I haven't put my fingers on the correct notes, um, in the mid-century at some point, I won't be more specific than that, um, through research that really was not very good. It, um, it was surveying people who were participating in Alcoholics Anonymous. It was a really low survey turnout, as surveys generally are, um, and sort of asking them, here, what happened on your road to addiction and recovery? And from the results of that very, very flawed study, um, Dr. Jelinek created this curve of this is how this is how addiction goes. And I don't know if you could see the the font is kind of small there, but, um, but you know, that you start with occasional relief drinking at the top and then gradually things get worse until, you know, after a few cycles, you have this moment of learning alcoholism is, a, is an illness. Um, you have an honest desire for help and that's what allows you to change. So there are certainly many, many people who go along this curve and who find this helpful um, in terms of thinking, okay, here's where I am and here, I'm not alone, right? I'm, there are other people who have experiences too. But again, it's based on basically terrible research. Um, in fact, they excluded women respondents because they were so different from the male respondents um, and just decided that that wasn't relevant. So, you know, it's not reflecting even the whole population that they were looking at. So what my point is here is that when we have certain narrative conventions like this, it can change the way we understand reality. For example, um, if somebody is you know, following along that curve and at a moment in their life, they're maybe developing more of a tolerance or using more often, you might say, all right, the only way is down, right? Whereas sometimes that's not true. Sometimes it's a bad moment and you get out of it. Um, so, so I think that there are certain narrative conventions that don't actually have to do with addiction, but that still are kind of in our heads when we're thinking about this topic. Um, these are cultural stories that are kind of deep in the way we understand things. Um, I think there are, I, I'm gonna mention three or four of them here, but you may have some ideas of, um, of, idea, of things that you also think um, are shaping this understanding that we may or may not be aware of. I think the most prominent one is the redemption narrative. And this comes out of evangelical Christianity. Um, the image I have here is from Pilgrim's Progress, which some people here may be familiar with. I've presented this a few times and people are very unfamiliar with Pilgrim's Progress in my experience. But um, so this is this terrific image of, some of you may know this story where um, the pilgrim you know, starts off on, it's this allegorical journey through the world uh, toward heaven. And so he goes through various, trials and tribulations, you know, the slough of despond and vanity fair, and things that have kind of gotten into our, our language, even if we don't know where they come from. Um, but the idea is that something bad happens to you. Um, you are tempted by a drug and you sin, right? You fall, you um, hit rock bottom. Things are terrible for you. Like in the, in the kind of Christian story, that means you're on your way to hell. Um, in terms of addiction, it usually means, you know, you lose your job, you lose your family, you're on the streets, you know, whatever that is. And then something happens, right? There's this moment of redemption by grace, by luck, by just being fortunate enough to meet the right people. And through that community, through those rituals, through that sharing, you're kind of redeemed and able to, um, to find, you know, happiness and, and goodness. So this, it's not an accident that this is very much the story that is told in all of those um, stories in the Alcoholics Anonymous big book. Um, the, the history of that organization is very linked with this um, kind, this branch of kind of Calvinist Christianity. Um, but as, uh, 
as was pointed out earlier, you know, the history of Bill W and where he came from affected, you know, what he thought was needed for alcoholics. And I think that's true of this kind of um, cultural narrative as well, that the way through follows this particular shape. Um, here's another one that is maybe less obvious and <laughs> less, less connected with the origins of AA. Uh, so some of you might remember this part from Pinocchio where little Pinocchio walks down the street and he's off to school, um, but he runs into some bad boys and they say, come with us to Pleasure Island and, uh, and that's where everything goes badly. So this is kind of the way peer pressure was taught when I was a kid, right? That, that bad people are gonna come up to you and say, try drugs or else. And, um, and then, you know, if you if you weren't strong enough to just say no, then you would um, you would start down that that curve of addiction. And you know, I think peer pressure is really important, um, but it doesn't necessarily work this way, right? Uh, perhaps sometimes it does. Uh, but when this is the model that we're teaching, for example, in Dare programs, it does not work. Uh, there is evidence that Dare certainly had no good effects and might have actually had bad effects on some students um, in terms of their likeliness to use drugs. And that's based on this idea of people are gonna try to get you to do drugs and you need to say no. Um, peer pressure more likely is going to come from uh, a desire to belong, from feeling excluded and looking for a way in. Um, so there are important peer, peer factors, but it's probably not, uh, if, we're, if this is the image we have in our head, we might not be able to address them very well. And then this is my favorite, but also probably unfamiliar to everybody. Um, there is a, a, a Victorian poem called Goblin Market by uh, Christina Rossetti. So this is written in the 19th century. And again, it's not about addiction necessarily. Um, I will tell you the story of this poem and you might, you might recognize where, I, where I'm coming from here. So it's about two young, beautiful women who live in the cabin um, on the edge of a wood and they're sisters. And it happens that in the wood live some goblins and the goblins keep coming up to them and saying, come and have some of our fruit. Um, <laughs> again, there's some peer pressure from the goblins. One of the sisters is tempted by this and, and tries the fruit. And it's, you know, there's a sort of orgy of eating fruit. Um, and, what happens then is that the goblins disappear. And having tried the fruit, she can't, she can't live. She, um, she wants more fruit so badly that she kind of wastes away. She can't eat anything else. Everything else tastes terribly to her. This like gorgeous young woman becomes kind of wizened and old because she is wasting away with desire for this fruit. Like it, the idea is it's totally rewired her brain and her personality and made it impossible for her to live well um, because she can't get this fruit. So she's, a, you know, she's in withdrawal basically. Um, and then it, you know, it ends happily. Her sister <laughs> bravely goes into the forest and finds the goblins and manages to get the, she won't eat the fruit, but they, um, they attack her with it. So it's like smeared all over her face and body. And she goes home and lets her sister kind of lick it off. And then that cures her. So <laughs> it works out okay in the end. But um, the reason I have this here is because I think that it, this is one of the hardest ideas to change is that when you try a drug, you're hooked, right? That they, it's like a hook that gets into your brain and won't let you go. Um, in a very kind of passive way, like you don't really have a choice about it. It's, um, it's going to take you over and, and give you a whole new personality. Again, drugs do have chemical, you know, powerful chemical properties and they do affect your brain and, um, and your behavior, but not that simply, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Also, you should read Goblin Market. It's terrific. Um, here's another I think pretty common idea about drug use. And it's the idea of the deal with the devil. And we see this a lot with um, creative people where actually I was just listening to a thing about um, The weekend, right? And like how his music is is telling this story about, about drug use and addiction. And, um, and it's sometimes thought that, you know, to be creative, it is helped along by drug use or that it's kind of like the price you pay for being, um, for being an artist or a musician. And the story I have here is um, from the play Faust and this, you may be familiar with the story of Dr. Faustus, which um, is a deal with the devil story. You know, the Faust wants this woman who's <laughs> depicted naked in the mirror there 
um, and and makes a deal for it, it obviously doesn't work out well, right? It, uh, when you make that deal, it's going to eat you away. And and um, even if you get what you want, it turns out that it is a, it is misery for you. So I think the Faust story is also mixed in with our understandings of how drugs work. All right, so here's some things that don't necessarily fit very well into the stories that we know. So the first is that mo most drug users don't get addicted. Um, and this is true for all drugs, uh, whether we're talking about heroin or crack or meth. Um, if you, you know, if you're going to use it one time, if you're going to use it sort of recreationally, you don't have a huge chance of becoming addicted to it. However, you know, 10% isn't nothing, right? Like if you're, you wouldn't want to play Russian roulette with, you know, one bullet in 10 chambers or however that works. Um, so it's not that it's not a problem. It's that it's not a problem for most people. And um, I, I think they're probably, you know, the reason we don't talk about that a lot is probably because we don't want to encourage people to take that risk, which entirely makes sense. But um, it also is leaving out most people's drug use. Um, so most people who have tried drugs will not see themselves reflected in how we're talking about drugs and addiction. Um, another one, this goes back to that goblet market chemical hook story, is that chemical dependency isn't the main thing. Um, it's part of addiction. Again, you know, small and significant, and it's meaningful. But uh, most of addiction comes from other reasons. Um, it's, it's about behavior. It's not about the substance. So the example here um, is that if you give cigarette smokers nicotine so that they have no withdrawal, they're, they're getting the drug that they want from the cigarette, only 17% of them will quit. So they're getting something else from that, you know, the socializing, the routine, the um, stress relief, whatever it is, uh, that's what they're addicted to, right? Not the nicotine itself, in addition to the nicotine. Um, as, as has been talked about a little bit here, recovery programs really don't work that well for most people, at least on the first try. Um, so the idea that all you have to do is get into recovery just isn't true. And most people will not um, succeed with any kind of recovery program. 12-step programs, you know, that we can talk a little bit more about the data there, but um, while they are very effective for people who stay in them, that is a really small part of the number of people who try. And so they kind of work for the people who work and don't work for other people. And, you know, this is another kind of place where shame can come in. You know, you try recovery, it doesn't work. You think, well, there's no hope for me, right? Whereas if you understand that, well, it usually doesn't work. <laughs> you, know, you usually have to keep trying. Um, then that can change the way you look at it. Um, and also, again, this feels like a third rail to say, but the most common outcome of addiction is recovery without treatment. Most people who, um, that's not to say that most people do it. It's like, if you take all the outcomes, right? Recovery with treatment, failure to recover, um, recovery without treatment. Uh, recovery without treatment happens most often. A lot of people age out. Um, a lot of people who struggle with addiction in their teens and twenties won't be struggling with it by the time they're 35. Um, you know, their brain matures, they grow up their life might stabilize, there might be other reasons, but um, it, it is very, very common for people to recover without treatment. Not that you shouldn't get into treatment, I want to say. <laughs> Take every chance you can to recover as early as you can, because um, I, as again was said earlier, you don't want to lose those years of your life, but, uh, but not getting into treatment isn't a death sentence either. So this is um, something I love to show my college students, and I thought some of you might as well. Um, another story that's pretty common <laughs> in our culture is that drinking is very normal and that drinking is part of social events and part of celebrations. And, you know, it's just, we're, we just drink all the time. It's not true. Most American adults, if you look at these deciles, the, the bottom 30% in terms of drinks per week, um, 30 percent of American adults aren't drinking. And basically if you're having 0.2 drink, 0.02 drinks per week, you're basically not drinking, right? Like that's having a drink a year or something. Um, so really about half of American adults are just not drinkers at all as we go up the scale here. So when we get to the uh, six, six decile, 0.63 drinks per week, you're having a drink every other week, right? That's not, you know, that's a very rare drinking. Um, when you, if you're somebody who actually like myself um, will have a glass of wine at night, say seven days a week, 
you can see that that's putting me above the eighth percentile, right? Like I had not thought that that made me kind of a heavy drinker, but it turns out in terms of what people are drinking in the US, um, that's a lot. That's a lot more than most people. Um, the really shocking thing here though, is what happens in the top decile. The top 10% of American drinkers are drinking 73.85 drinks per week. So more than 10 drinks a day. Um, that's obviously unhealthy. There is no, you know, as, as much as there may be very various ways to engage with drinking and drugs, like it can't be good for anybody to drink 73 drinks a week. Um, the other thing to note here though, is how that number far dwarfs. If you add up all the other drinks on this chart, it's not even close to that 73 drinks a week. So if you are somebody selling alcohol, if you're a beer company or a whiskey company, who are you going to target in your advertising, in your, you know, in your uh, viral posts and in, in your native marketing? You're going to target those heavy drinkers. The alcohol industry depends on problematic drinking. It could not exist in its current form without that level of problematic drinking. It would, if you take that 73 drinks out, this collapses, right? Um, so I think that's also a really important thing to remember that we're getting these messages all the time that try to normalize very regular drinking, but it's actually not normal. And maybe we need to reflect that more too, especially on college campuses where we, you know, even our admissions, people will make jokes about how much everybody's drinking all the time. And I think we need to stop doing that. Um, all right. So another thing that is often, um, uh, wrongly understood is, is the harmfulness of different drugs. We talk a lot about opioids and they are super harmful, um, but they're not nearly as harmful as alcohol in terms of number of deaths, in terms of um, harm to other people, in terms of violence. Alcohol causes by far the most harm. Um, tobacco also kills a lot of people. This, this is actually a kind of old chart. Um, I just kind of like the way it was presented. But it's, um, so it may not be entirely up to date. It's also from the UK. So it's not, a, again, exactly going to re um, reflect what we're seeing. But um, it's divided up by harm to, to users and harm to others. And so that's another thing that I think is helpful to think about when we think about drugs. Like, is taking the drug um, something like LSD or mushrooms there's not a lot of evidence that that's going to hurt anybody else. You're not likely to cause harm to anybody else. Um, whereas alcohol, totally opposite story. You're very likely to cause harm to anybody else as any, you know, police officer or uh, first responder will tell you, um, or somebody who works on a college campus, for example. So again, just trying to maybe have a little bit more reality in the way we look at, at different drugs and not assume that alcohol is, is kind of like the okay drug because it's not illegal. All right, so if we have some narrative conventions that might be shaping how we understand drugs and alcohol and addiction, um, what are some other ones that we might use that will help us understand this in different ways? All right, so this one, some of you will recognize this uh, image. It's from Animal House, which is a movie that I have not seen recently, and I'm sure it does not stand up to uh, the test of time in many ways, but it's this idea that um, drinking is a, a thing you do in college and that's okay, right? And that's fun and that's cool. And the deans who are trying to get you to stop are the bad guys. Um, students will say, have told me this phrase that it's not an addiction until you graduate. So at first glance, you might think, okay, this is totally wrong. You can be addicted in college. Binge drinking is always bad. Um, but it's a little bit true, right? Like somebody who is binge drinking on the weekends in college. We don't like that that much, but it's quite different from somebody binge drinking on the weekends in, um, you know, when they're 30 and are trying to hold down a job, right? There is a way in which it's kind of age appropriate and at least not super destructive to be um, using drugs and alcohol in kind of harmful ways when you're in college or when you're very young that uh, become more of a problem later, later in life. Um, so age matters a lot, as I'll talk about a little bit later, but um, again, a lot of people do age out of addiction, and it may be that they graduate, they get a job, their life is a little more stable, um, they, have a little, they have other things to, to do and to pay attention to and to feel responsibility for, and, and that, you know, makes it easy for them to quit the level of drinking or, or whatever they're doing before. 
again, that's not true for everybody. And I think we all know stories of those people who weren't able to stop after college and kind of kept up at that level while all their friends stopped and then it became much more of a problem. So here's some more about age. Um, I think you all may know that early drug use is a super strong risk factor for later addiction. Um, student, uh, kids who are using it at 12 or 13 are, are much, much more likely to um, have drug and addiction problems later. Most active addiction will be in the late adolescent and early adult periods. And so here's a chart. Um, uh, this is for clients entering treatment. So again, it's not reflecting everybody, but I think it does um, reflect the, the general shape of, um, of drug use. And that's going to hit somewhere kind of in the early or mid 20s. And then it's going to um, drop down after that. Although, as you can see, the cannabis peak is, is a bit earlier. There's, there's different factors. Um, natural recovery, which is recovery without treatment, often happens after about 10 years of use. Um, so, you know, if you know somebody who's been really struggling to recover and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, that can be a really helpful thing to keep in mind that for many people, it takes about 10 years um, and they're going to have to go through those, those terrible cycles um, for a while before they're ready to stop. Again, that's not to say you shouldn't try to get into treatment. 10 years is a long time. That's a lot of life. And if you cannot be addicted during that time, that is obviously much better. All right. So this was mentioned earlier. Um, this is the famous Rat Park experiment um, that Bruce Alexander carried out in the 1970s. And I'll, I'll just repeat this in case people didn't hear it earlier. But the, the idea is that former uh, experiments about drug use had put rats in a cage with a bottle of water and a bottle of whatever the drug was, morphine or cocaine, and found that drug um, the rats would use drugs so much that they would kill themselves. They would not eat, they would do nothing but use drugs until they overdosed. And this really feeds into this chemical hook model of why we think um, people will die from drugs because it just gets into your brain. It takes over even the most basic um, self-defense, like self-preservation instincts are taken over by the drugs as we see in this case of the rats. However, Bruce Alexander um, designed this experiment where he put rats in a place that they would like, where they had other things to do other than drugs um, and, and, and including very crucially other rats um, to hang out with and found that they would basically use the drugs recreationally. Um, they would use them sometimes, but nobody overdosed in those, in those rat parks. And this, um, there are a lot of associations with kind of loneliness and isolation um, with addiction. And we, since as has often been bemoaned in recent years, um, we're seeing kind of an increase in loneliness and isolation. We're seeing people living farther apart in literally bigger houses with more rooms, you know, that there, there isn't as much um, human interaction that this may be contributing to um, our addiction problem. There's kind of a question about whether online communities will mitigate that. Um, I think we don't quite know yet, but it's it's a hope um, that that's one way people may be finding connections. Obviously, it's also a way people are finding all kinds of other bad stuff, but you know, this is life, it's all very mixed. So um, adverse childhood experiences. Again, this is a this is a room that <laughs> will be familiar with this research, but it's almost it's almost comical how strong these um, correlations are. Like if you look at this chart, it's like, that's not a real chart. How could that possibly be true? But the correlation between what are called adverse childhood experiences, which is a list of things that may have happened to you as a child that include things like trauma, neglect, you know, parental illness or death, parental incarceration, um, you know, various things that would, would be a traumatic event um, to a child. If you, the more of those you have, the more likely you are to experience addiction. It's, I think, it might be the strongest predictor. Um, I think genetics, people talk about genetics being accounting for about 50% of um, likelihood of addiction, but it's also quite hard to separate out genetics from the experience you have as a child if you're living with your parents. Um, so one of the reasons that this may, um, this may be true is that children who are having these childhoods where they're not learning ways of healthy bonding and coping, um, use drugs to do that when they're adults because they haven't learned other things, that they haven't had the chance to form really solid attachments with family members and others in their community, drugs might take that place. 
So again, this is moving away from the kind of moral idea of you, you drink or you use drugs because you're lazy and selfish and more because, you know, you're trying to deal with something that happened in your past. So I really like this, um, this graphic, um, switching away from those arcs where we see one path that people follow at one direction and thinking instead about a continuum of use. Um, and I did borrow this from the New Hampshire Harm Reduction uh, Coalition. So Tim King might recognize it. Um, so instead of having just two things, you are or you're not, you're sober, you're an alcoholic. Instead, there's different ways of using. And that's true, like, if you know, if we think about most of our experiences, we, we go up and down in, in the things that we do. Um, can we think about this as steps? And any step you take in the direction of moderation or abstinence is a good step and we celebrate those, right? Any step you take backwards, you know, that's um, something that we're gonna try to address, right? But it's not, it's not a, you know, I, I know a lot of addiction professionals no longer use the word relapse, right? They'll say um, a setback or I think um, Jason Harris earlier said something about um, somebody returning to use, you know, we're, we're using different words to, to get rid of the idea that if you take a step back, it's over, right? because um, that's really demoralizing for people and makes it harder for them to get help. So can we frame it instead as a chronic health issue? And we don't think of like, all right, you got to get into recovery and get treat and get cured. Instead, we treat it. We don't try to cure it. We're treating it over time. It, and that's going to change over time what that requires. Um, and it might require different kinds of interventions at different times. This is another image I really like um, of, of the continuum of use. So, uh, and I think again, it's important to, to bring in all drugs to this. So it might be pretty comfortable to think about alcohol as something you can use recreationally or moderately. And then maybe, you know, if you're doing it every day as I have already confessed to doing that we would call that chronic use. Um, and maybe that's somewhere where you'd wanna think about, is that really what you wanna be doing? Does it become compulsive use? Um, the idea of obsessive compulsive disorder came up earlier. Um, is it something that you can't stop yourself from doing even if it's harming you, you know? And then does it become chaotic use? Is it really messing up your life to do this? Um, to think about those things as different is important rather than just using, not using. So as I said, it's pretty comfortable to think of it that way with alcohol. For a lot of people, it's harder to think of it that way with heroin, right? Or with crack or with um, meth. But some people are using it in these ways. And we always want somebody to be in chronic use rather than compulsive use or in compulsive use rather than chaotic use. So we want to keep people moving toward the green end of this spectrum. Um, this uh, this is my final image, and it's um, a student of mine really liked this idea of the staircase. So she drew this, and I really liked it. Um, she's put under it the the things that contribute to addiction and recovery, and um, and you can see on the right how she's included, you know, medications as well as Alcoholics Anonymous. There's faith traditions in there. There's um, community. Um, whereas on the left is things like PTSD, uh, the set and setting of drug use, which we haven't talked about, but I'm sure is very familiar to many of you, disconnection, isolation. Um, those are the things that are going to be at the bottom of those staircases. So we want to be moving people up, moving people along. And that's, um, that's the model I would like to start thinking about in terms of how we, um, how we understand these stories of drugs and addiction. So I'm going to end there to have some time for questions, um, with just a thank you to the University of Pikeville for inviting me and the Lilly Fellows program for funding this, um, this terrific conference, but also to thank everybody who has shared their stories of addiction. Um, I think that is so brave and so important. And so I, I want to mark that as, as really contributing to making a change. And also to all of you for taking all this time to be here today um, and to be spend your Friday on Zoom. I appreciate um, your willingness to do that. So I'll stop now and see if there's any questions. What a great presentation. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, as we're waiting on other questions to come in, I do have a question about, you know, as you talked about these different ways that we talk about addiction, is there any current uh, materials that you're reading or reading with your students that you say, ah, oh, this is really telling a very honest, maybe more accurate narrative? Yeah. 
That's a great question. Um, so I teach a course with the same title actually, and it focuses on stories of addiction. And I'm always looking for memoirs to read. Um, there are issues here. So I, I asked a question about publishing earlier because I think there's um, issues with publishing. Um, almost all of the addiction memoirs you can find are written by white men, um, some women who are either middle class or more and who are many of them are writers right <laughs> and are very successful that's not indicative of everybody who's struggling with this at all i think that has a lot to do with the publishing industry and who they're publishing um i this year introduced a book called heavy by kiese layman l-a-y-m-o-n which isn't marketed i don't think as an addiction memoir but he talks about what it's like to grow up um, in Mississippi. He's a black man um, li living with a, a single mother who is, I think you can say abusive. Um, and, and to grow up in that environment, um, he sort of makes the connections between the environment he's growing up in, the racism he's facing with compulsive behaviors that he's developing later in life, um, compulsive eating and then compulsive dieting, also gambling. So it's not about drugs, um, but I think it is about addiction and about how, about, you know, it doesn't have the story of, of, you know, hitting rock bottom and then recovering. It's this kind of up and down life that he's going through um, and, and doing his best, you know, as, as we all are. Uh, so I'd really recommend that one. I think it, it's really interesting. Um, my students also really love um, a book by Kat Marnell that's called How to Murder Your Life. It's very, very fun to read. She kind of came up in the, you know, the blogging era, writing for, um, you know, Exo Jane and Vice and platforms like that. And she's got a very bloggy, fun voice. Uh, so, you know, you'll read it real fast. But she's, she's, her addiction is to Adderall as well as to other drugs. And she doesn't recover really by the end. Um, so that's another one that I find. There's just so much like texture and interesting stuff in there. Also, that one's fun to read. So those are two recommendations. Great. Um, some other questions coming in. Do you have any thoughts on mommy wine culture? Yeah. Um, do I have, I mean, I think I'm squarely in that demographic, frankly. Um, so I think, um, I think this is one of those normalization of alcohol things, right? So, and I, you know, I don't know, I don't want to say it's a conspiracy or something, but I'm sure that the alcohol industry promotes this idea that like moms love wine, <laughs> you know, mommies just want to drink wine. However, it's also true that moms do sometimes love wine. Um, and I, and that's not something to be ashamed of, right? Like having a glass of wine with a friend is terrific uh, if that works for you. Um, so I think that it is one of these places where, all right, I'm gonna make a big, huge statement here, where there are problems in American culture where people are overworked and underappreciated and exhausted and subject to all you know the ravages of capitalism. And our answer to it is gonna be a product that kind of takes the edge off, right? Um, and we answer all kinds of product, uh, all kinds of problems that way. Um, whether it's, you know, even a, a prescription drug that helps you with focus or helps you um, with, with feeling good about life or something like that. They, we tend to go to these answers that are, are chemicals um, because they're pretty easy and they make money for people rather than thinking more about changing the circumstances for people so that they can feel whole and at ease in their lives. So that's my, my galaxy brain response to mommy wine culture. Great. So what about the impact of drug use on brain development in younger persons? Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about aging out of addiction. Um, so we were just wondering if you could clarify a little bit more about that. Yeah, this is such a, such a, I don't, I don't know, is it a catch 22? It's just like a terrible reality um, where young people, adolescents are primed for addiction. You know, their brains respond more strongly to stimuli than our old tired adult brains do. So, um, so if something is pleasurable, it feels way more pleasurable to them. And if something is painful, it feels way more painful. Um, and, um, and so, so they're really primed for this. Um, and also they don't have a lot of coping skills yet, right? Like they haven't learned them. So, so if they're, if they're finding drugs helpful and, and pleasurable, they're much, much more likely to be addicted to them. And this is going to affect their brain development. It's going to mean they're not going to develop those coping skills that they would otherwise be, be learning um, through high school and college. 
um, because they use drugs for that instead. It might mean they're not developing social connections, which would help them develop, you know, that's part of our brain development. So it's sort of a tragedy that the most vulnerable people are also going to be permanently affected by this. Um, so, so yes, we do need to keep kids off drugs, but the way we're, we're trying to do it isn't working all that well. And we also need to, as has been said before, we need to be extending empathy um, toward people who are using drugs. Because uh, even if we can't get them off of it, we want to kind of keep them alive and, and, uh, and as healthy as we can until they are ready to get off. So yeah, so it's one of these things where the, the social trends, um, you might say, okay, lots, this works for lots of people. And yet for individuals, it's still a tragedy, right? So um, you're still seeing people who are, whose lives really do get ruined by adolescent drug use. And I appreciate in the Q&A the, the Shiggy Bain um, uh, suggestion. I have not read that, but I'm excited to. Uh, also, there was a question about uh, any any work or, or thoughts on pulp fiction addiction uh, narratives of the 40s and 50s. Hmm. Do I have any of those thoughts? Uh, let's see. I'm sure I can come up with one. So yeah. So this, I'm thinking about the kind of like noir uh, style. You know, the hard bitten detectives and uh, and the drinking. I I mean. I don't. I would like somebody to tell me. You know, you read about three martini lunches and things like that. Is that really like, I think martinis have gotten bigger, honestly, like if you, we had these old martini glasses that were these little three, three ounce glasses. I'm like, that's not how they serve them anymore. <laughs> so I think in some ways drinking has, has, is, it's hard to compare, you know? Um, but I also think that there was a lot of trauma for people in the forties and fifties, right? Like they're, they're, you know, generations of war. These are people who have been traumatized by world events and and by war in many cases. Um, so it's not surprising that alcohol is such a big part of that. This is also coming post prohibition where people kind of forgot how to deal with alcohol and <laughs> had to figure it out again. I, I guess what I'm saying is I think there probably is some interesting cultural stuff about that, but I don't really know it. So I'm not the person to answer it. And then, you know, when you were showing about um, harm reduction in New Hampshire, um, are there any narratives or common mythologies that you think are a better reference point for telling addiction stories? Sorry, can you say that one more time? Okay, so the question is this. Um, it's about the, the new the, the harm reduction coalition and it's great to see all that, but are there any other narratives or common mythologies that you think are better reference points for telling addiction stories? Yeah, you know, I guess I didn't really give any any other any alternative narratives, just sort of alternative shapes and metaphors. Um, I think Hmm. I'm going to have to think about this because I think there is an answer. You know, so one thing that has been happening recently in recovery is the rise of, um, I think it's called refuge recovery that um, is more based on Buddhist traditions, which have more of an idea of things go around in circles, right? And, and we, it, that doesn't mean you're not going anywhere. That's just life. Life is kind of going around in these circles and you kind of deal with it as best you can at any given moment. Um, as opposed to this, this, as I've called it, evangelical Christian idea of you're going in one direction, one arrow from one place to another and you wanna make sure to get to the right place. So I think that I would want, I'm gonna think really hard about this afterwards and it's not gonna to come to me right now, but um, I, I'd want a story that's more presentist, that's more about kind of where are you now and what do you need? Um, and less about um, how do you get from point A to point B. Helpful, thank you. Um, and one other follow-up question is we were talking about uh, brain development and um, aging out. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do we, how do we, how do we respond to the idea if the brain is so impacted, how does a person then age out? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And again, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm not sure I, I have the technical answer here, but um, I think he, the brain is impacted by everything that happens to us, right? Um, and we don't know, you know, so most, again, most of these people are not gonna be addicted for the rest of their lives. Most of them are going to recover. Um, 
we don't know how that's going to hurt them going forward, like how that past addiction makes their brain different than it would have been otherwise, right? Like we don't have that alternative past to compare it to. So it is going to affect their brains. It may give them, you know, problems that they deal with for the rest of their lives. It may also affect them in good ways. They may be more empathetic, right? Like they might be less judgmental of other people. Um, I, you know, one thing I didn't talk much about is there, there's, I think a growing desire to look at, you know, people use drugs because they do something good for them. Right. And often that, that, that goes off the rails and it becomes bad, but there are people who use, you know, psychedelics or, um, or other drugs as, in a way that actually is positive, that maybe it is helping some of these kids socialize in a way that they couldn't otherwise. Um, and this new book that uh, I mentioned in the chat earlier from Carl Hart is, is, a, is a neuroscientist at uh, is it NYU, somewhere in New York, who, maybe Columbia actually, who says, I use heroin every day. I think it's better for me than alcohol. And you know, this is a good part of my life. So I think there's there's more interest in saying like the effects of drugs aren't necessarily all bad, um, but a lot of them are bad. And again, when you're talking about teenage brain development, it's not something you wanna see um, in say your own children, but, um, but it doesn't mean, I guess the point I keep trying to make is it doesn't mean it's the end of the road. It doesn't mean we write that kid off because oh, their brain's ruined now. It's gonna be changed. Um, we don't really know how, right? So I guess, again, this idea is like, what do they need at this point? Um, and, and so on into the future.